everyone, and welcome to another edition of Essays on Abolition, uh, the series in which I read from the collection of essays from the Colin Kaepernick project called Abolition for the People, essays about getting rid of the police, getting rid of prisons, and or reform, and or not reform, and or I don't know. Each one is its own little mystery, and thus we are here once again. I uh, hope you all are having a good Sunday. Uh, let's see, make sure I got everything set up here. Yes, all right. Yes, I uh, just thought I'd do another one of these, as I have done on Sundays past, because uh, I'm always curious, and I was thinking about this before the, uh, the stream. Uh, I don't trust when people give me summaries of things that I should look at as important. Uh, you know, the New York Times book reviewer or something says, you know, here's four books that are the most important, et cetera, et cetera, to pay attention to in this moment, yada, yada, yada. Like, why? I'd rather hear it from directly from the source. I'd rather know what it is that's being said than just take it on faith that someone or something or some book or some theory is important. Uh, because nine times out of 10, as those of you who have followed my TEDx talks and everything else for some time now will know that when you actually hear it from the source, most times it doesn't sound like it makes a whole lot of sense. And yet we're told often and often and often that uh, certain individuals are important or important speakers or minds on these issues. And uh, always seems to be that the emperor has no clothes. So that's just what I was thinking about uh, before today's broadcast. But before we get into the reading of today's article, just want to say hello to all of you who have decided to join me for this. Uh, Keeverdam, Luke Skywalker 2, God of Plague, uh, said, catching up on some scribe vids while I'm waiting for this one. Boring work is good for listening. I am, and I was, I saw that just before I uh, went live. Uh, I am flattered uh, that you or anyone <laughs> takes the time to watch uh, my videos in sequence or in bulk. I really appreciate that. Uh, some Namdiel Nation, hello. Adonis Bartolote. Okay, now I'm going to, for the sake of posterity, premiere uh, the results of Adonis's uh, work on the next TED Excellence because it's most relevant there. But uh, I just wanna say thank you to Adonis Bartolote uh, for the effort that he put into uh, making a little promo for uh, TED Excellences. Uh, I will be using it uh, here and there as things proceed, but definitely on the next TED Excellence with full credit given in the description, I promise. Uh, so that's just a teaser uh, for what will come up probably tomorrow, uh, but we'll wait and see. So if you guys haven't already seen it, check out my Twitter. I just put it out there earlier, uh, retweeted it. Thank you so much, Adonis. I really, uh, again, uh, once more, I'm flattered that you put that much time and effort into that. That's amazing. So thank you for that. Uh, let's see who else is here. Check your logic. Hello, Green Death, Beggarit, Aspie Ante, Kay Scholl, James Andrew Morrison, Brad Young, No Name, uh, Bruno Montiero, and I think oh John Smith Sprint Sprint Cars Rule, and I think that's everybody right now. Jonathan Peterson, hello. All right, so let's get into the article. Link is in the description if you'd like to read it for yourself with the warning that they have a limitation on non-subscribers and how many articles you can read per month. I've hit my limit for this month, so this might be the last uh, essay on abolition uh, for November. If I decide to do any more, I, I may just stop after this. I think I've, I think I've run through the gamut of, uh, of the ideas coming out of these essays. Uh, and I certainly haven't done them all. There's like... 20 or 30 of them or something, and I've only done like five or six. Uh, thank you, this is Kyle. Hello, chat people and scribbles. Not to jinx, but I might be getting my first dog this upcoming Wednesday. I'm going to name it Sif. Aw, puppy dog. Well, congratulations. Uh, and not to jinx it, because, you know, jinx was the, the name of SDA's puppy. The, the puppy that I inadvertently named yeah, anyway. All right, so what do we have today? Putting a black face on police agendas. Putting a black face on police agendas. All right. Let's see. Black cops don't make policing any less anti-black. 
I'm going to I'm going to repeat that one more time for those in the cheap seats. Black cops don't make policing any less anti-black. The idea that we can resolve racism by integrating a fundamentally anti-black institution in the US is the most absurd notion of all. Um, how long have there been black police officers in the US? I, I don't know the answer to that question. Maybe our our author will tell us. And this uh, essay is by Bree Newsom Bass. Uh, if I remember correctly, she is most famous for having torn down a Confederate flag in, I want to say it was Missouri. Uh, I guess it was a famous Confederate flag or was in front of the state house or something like that. And then, uh, yeah, eventually they decided to just remove it altogether, but she was the one who tore it down. If I remember correctly, I might be a little bit off there. Uh, let's see. So moving down past the abolition for the people and into the article proper. A mid recent growing, uh, a mid, <clears throat> let me try that again. Amid recent growing calls for defunding police this summer, a set of billboards appeared in Dallas, Atlanta, and New York City. Each had the words, no police, no peace, printed in large, bold letters next to an image of a black police officer. Funded by a conservative right-wing think tank, the billboards captured all the hallmarks of modern pro-policing propaganda. The jarring choice of language, a deliberate corruption of the protest, protest chant, no justice, no peace, follows a pattern we see frequently from proponents of the police state. Any word or phrase made popular by the modern movement is quickly co-opted and repurposed until it's rendered virtually meaningless. But perhaps the most insidious aspect of modern pro-police propaganda is reflected in the choice to make the officer on the billboard the face of a black man. This is in keeping with a narrative pro-police advocates seek to push on a regular basis in mass media, that policing can't be racist when there are black officers on the force and that the police force itself is an integral part of black communities. When Freddie Gray died in police custody, police defenders quickly pointed out that three of the officers involved were black, implying that racism couldn't be a factor in a case where the offending officers were of the same race as the victim. Uh, it's true, you cannot say for 100% certainty that simply because someone is of race X, that racism against race X was not a thought or factor involved in some situation. Because as many people seem to forget, racism is not necessarily harbored simply by people against another race. It could be in fact racism against their own. It is to elevate and or denigrate other people on the basis of their race, including one's own. So that is not necessarily untrue. And yet, how do you prove that it was racism? When I scaled the flagpole at South Carolina's capital, okay, it was South Carolina, not Missouri, I apologize. South Carolina's capital in 2015 and lowered the Confederate flag Many noted that it was a black officer who was tasked with raising the flag to the top of its pole again. When an incident of brutality brings a city to its brink, black police chiefs are paraded to podiums and cameras to serve as the face of the United States racist police state and to symbolically restore a sense of order. Black police chiefs are paraded to podiums. Like they're just inserted there? Are, are you saying that black police chiefs are just tokens? They're just window dressing? They're not there because they deserve to be? Um, I, that's the implication I get. All right, moving on. One of the most frequent recommendations from police reformists is to recruit and promote more black officers. This is based on an argument that the primary problem with policing centers on a, quote, breakdown of trust, unquote, between police forces and communities they have terrorized for decades. The solution then is to, quote, restore trust, unquote, between the two parties by recruiting officers who resemble the communities they police. It's interesting that she, again, seemingly, we haven't gotten that far yet, is uh, opposing that notion since time and time and time again in videos and uh, presentations I've watched, and, and just look at my Curriculum of Fear series if you don't believe me, 
I am told over and over and over again that the correct way to interact with people of a certain race is to have leaders installed of that same race. Otherwise, the people who are like the students or the customers or whoever won't feel comfortable with someone who does not resemble them. Or you need someone who resembles your workforce or resembles your student body in order for the student body or the workforce to feel at home or something. So it's interesting that she is pushing back against that notion in this instance. Images of police officers dancing or playing basketball with black children in economically deprived neighborhoods are often published as local news items to help drive this narrative home. The idea gained traction in the aftermath of numerous urban rebellions in the 1960s and has seen a resurgence in the wake of the 2014 Ferguson uprising. Rebellions uprising. Uh, not to keep self-plugging, but uh, I've done a couple of videos about the interesting turns of phrase when um, trying to lessen the impact of riots, call them uprisings or rebellions. Back to the article. When protests broke out in Atlanta this past summer in response to the killings of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and Ahmed Arbery, the city's black mayor, Keisha Lance Bottoms, held a press conference flanked by some of Atlanta's most famous and wealthy black residents. Together, they pleaded for protesters to go home and leave property alone. Uh, if their concern was over property or the safety thereof, they weren't protesters. They were not referring to protesters. There's a difference between protesters and rioters and looters. That you're collecting them all under one phrase of protester says more about you than it does about the mayor and her proponents. Soon after, Rayshard Brooks was killed by white police officers in Atlanta. Okay. The moment exposed a class divide that exists in cities all over the nation a chasm between the image of black affluence promoted by black politicians and the black petite bourgeoisie, middle class, and the lived realities of the majority of black residents in those cities, many of whom still face disproportionate unemployment, displacement by rapid gentrification, and policies that cater to white corporate interests. If the solution to racism were simply a matter of a few select black people gaining entry to anti-black institutions, we would see different outcomes than what we're, see, what we're witnessing now. But the idea that we can resolve racism by integrating what is perhaps the most fundamentally anti-black institution in the US, its policing and prison industry, is the most absurd notion of all. Okay, so trying to respond to claims that the police are a bunch of white supremacist jackbooted thugs by having a diverse workforce amongst the police is not the answer. Okay, so what is the solution? I mean, obviously the end result or the end goal, I assume is simply getting rid of police and getting rid of prisons as we've seen and had quoted to us in almost nearly all of these essays. Will this be the first one to give us a alternative solution, even a bad alternative solution? I have my doubts. Part of the reason why calls to defund police have sent sh such shockwaves through the, throughout the nation, prompting placement of pro-police billboards and pushback from figures of the black establishment, is because it cuts right to the heart of how structural racism operates in the United States. At a time when the black elite would prefer to measure progress by their own tokenized positions of power and symbolic gestures like murals, the push to defund police would require direct confrontation with how the white supremacist system has been organized since the end of chattel slavery, when the prisons replaced plantations as the primary tool of racial control. Actions that may have been widely seen as adequate responses to injustice just a couple of decades ago now ring hollow to many observers who see that black people continue to be killed by a system that remains largely unchanged. Okay, so black mayors, black police chiefs, black district attorneys, black law enforcement or black politicians in general, they're all tokenized symbolic gestures. 
Got it. Police forces represent some of the oldest white fraternal organizations in the United States. The rules of who is empowered to police and who is subject to policing are fundamental to the organization of the racial caste system. Even in the earliest days of an integrating police forces, black officers were often told they couldn't arrest white people. The integration of police forces does nothing to alter their basic function as the primary enforcers of structural racism on a daily basis, and the presence of black officers only serves as an attempt to mask this fact. Okay, so all black police officers are not there of their own merit or volition. They are placed there for window dressing and public relations. Okay. Police forces in America began as slave patrols, and their primary function has always been to act in service of the white ownership class and its capitalist production. In one century, that meant policing and controlling enslaved black people with the purview to use violence against free black people as well. In another, it involved cracking down on organized labor for the benefit of white capitalists. Receiving a badge and joining the force has been an entryway to white manhood for many European immigrants, providing them a sense of citizenship and superiority when they would have traditionally been part of the peasantry rather than the white owner class. Okay. That spirit of white fraternity remains deeply entrenched in the culture of policing and its unions today, regardless of this new wave of black police chiefs and media spokespeople. Police forces became unionized around the same time various other public employees sought collective bargaining rights. However, under capitalism, their role as maintainers of race property relations remains the same. The most fundamental rule of race established under the let me try that again. The most fundamental rule of race established under chattel slavery was that black people were the equivalent of white property, if not counted as less than property. This relationship between race and property is the most overt during periods of open rebellion against the police state, where officers are deployed to use lethal force in the interest of protecting inanimate property. Protecting inanimate property, okay? We see swifter and harsher punishments handed out to those who vandalize police cars than to police who assault and kill black people. Aha. Uh -huh. This is a major reason why the press conference in Atlanta with T.I. and Killer Mike struck people as classist and out of touch with the majority of black experience. I did not see or know what the press conference in Atlanta with T.I. and Killer Mike was. So I don't know how to reference that, but okay. This same pattern extends throughout the carceral state. Roughly a quarter of all bailiffs, correctional officers, and jailers are black, yet there's no indication that diversifying the staff of a racist institution results in less violence and death for those who are held within it. That's because the institution continues to operate as designed. It is not broken, as reformists are fond of saying. The fallacy is in believing the function of police and prisons is to mete out punishment and justice in an equitable manner and not to first and foremost serve as a means of maintaining the race, gender, and class hierarchy of an oppressive society. Right, so there are no white men in prison. There are no black judges. There are no black police chiefs. There are no black... A correctional officer. Oh, sorry. No, wait. There are. There are, except they're all tokens. They're all window dressing. They're not there because they want to be, because they worked to be, because they earned it. No, they're there. They're placed there. They're inserted simply to act as public relations. That's the only reason that they're there. Yes, let's reduce everybody down to nothing because of their skin color. You know, you notice what's happening here? If you see a black judge, we saw this in one of the, I think actually just the previous essay. If you see a black judge or you see a black prosecutor, they are uh, being allowed to run the house, as our last author put it. And our author here is telling us that if you see a black person in any capacity of law enforcement, uh, they're not really there because they want to be, because they worked to be, they're there only because they're black. 
put there because they were black. Positioned there because they were black. Nothing about them as individuals, their personal efforts, their personal beliefs, anything else matter. They're just tokens because of their skin color is what our author is telling us. Okay. Believing that the system is broken rather than functioning exactly as intended requires a certain adherence to white supremacist and anti-black beliefs. I'm gonna read that one again. Believing that the system is broken rather than functioning exactly as intended requires a certain adherence to white supremacist and anti-black beliefs. Okay. One has to ignore the rampant amount of violence, fraud, and theft being committed by some of the most powerful figures in society with little to no legal consequence, while massive amounts of resources are devoted to the hyper-policing of the poor for infractions as minor as trespassing, shoplifting, and turnstile jumping at subway stations. Well, that was very specific. The Trump era has provided some of the starkest examples of this dynamic. The most powerful person in the nation and his associates have been able to break the law and violate the Constitution, including documented crimes against humanity, in full view of the public while he proclaims himself the upholder of law and order. Wealthy celebrities involved in the college admissions bribery scandal have gotten away with a slap on the wrist for orchestrating a multi-million dollar scheme while a dozen NYPD officers surrounded a black teenager, guns drawn, for the crime of failing to pay $2.75 for a subway ride. Okay, now that story I'm not familiar with. Um, you know, if you're, if you're expecting me to say, oh, the police would never do something outlandish or people would never overreact or something else, you're not going to hear me say that because it does happen. The question is, is that the norm or is it an anomaly? And if it is the norm and if it is accepted, and if it's not a big deal, and it's part of the process, and we all just turn our heads and look the other way, why do we hear about those stories? Why do they sound outlandish? Why do they outrage people? If there was a big conspiracy to have the police murder black people just because they're black people, why are there protests? Why are there riots? Why are there calls for reform from all over the place? Did you see the initial reaction from everybody at the video of George Floyd's arrest. I mean, absent other facts or other information that has come out since, what was everybody's initial reaction from the right, from the left, white, black, and otherwise? Yeah, it was like, WTF, mate. Something's got to change. That's not good. If, if our entire society was based around this and this was our intended purpose for our police force, why do we get ticked off when somebody gets gunned down who didn't need to be? Tell me why. Moving on. The propaganda that depicts this type of policing as being essential to public safety and order is fundamentally classist and anti-black. It traces its roots to the black codes that were passed immediately after the Civil War to control the movements of newly freed black people. Yes, I'm sure all modern police forces in their training go back to the black codes after the Civil War in educating its officers. I'm, I'm pretty sure that's part of the curriculum. And by the way, guys, thank you for joining the police force. Now let me tell you about some laws and policies that were in existence back in 1860 uh, and 1865 that uh, you're going to follow now. And they're not actually on the books in law now, but you're going to follow them because they used to exist. It relies on the racist assumption that black people would run amok and pose a threat to the larger society if not kept under the constant surveillance of a police force that has authority to kill them if deemed necessary and with virtual impunity. That's why we are inundated with a narrative that depicts the police officer who regularly patrols predominantly black communities as being an essential part of maintaining order in society. Uh, no. Police officers who patrol anywhere are seen as an essential part of maintaining order in society. If you would like examples, uh, let me recommend you take a look at what happened in Seattle this past summer, where you had a six block area absent of any authority, no law and order present at all, as dictated by the city's mayor. 
what happened there? What kind of paradise was created in the absence of police officers? What replaced police officers in that six block area? And what did those people do without any oversight and with authority that they granted themselves? Might I ask? One of the primary talking points against calls to defund and abolish police is that black communities would have no way to maintain peace and order and that a state of chaos would ensue. In wealthier neighborhoods, if an officer is present at all, they're most likely positioned by a gate at the top of the neighborhood to monitor who enters. Meanwhile, the officer assigned to the predominantly black community is there to keep a watchful eye on the residents themselves and to ensure that they are contained in their designated place within the larger city or town. Really? That's what police officers do in predominantly black communities. They're, what, penning them in? You're not allowed to cross this line without the correct skin color? Sounds interesting. The current political divide on this issue falls exactly along these lines, separating those who think the system is simply in need of reform and those who correctly define the problem as the system itself. The reality is that black people fall on both sides of this divide, which is why we find so many black officers in uniform arguing for a reformist agenda, even as every reform they propose is vociferously opposed by the powerful majority white police unions and most of the rank and file. Reformists remain committed to preserving the existing system, even though the idea of reforming it to be the opposite of what it was designed to be is an unproven theory that's no more realistic than the idea of abolishing police altogether. Uh, okay. And again, what is your recommendation in the alternative? Abolish, defund, remove, okay. And then uh, you'll be putting all of those black officers out of work, all of those black police chiefs, um, and, and they want to be part of the solution and they want reforms, but they're still tokens, correct? Continuing. The most pressing question remains, why are we seeking to integrate and reform modern manifestations of the slave patrols and plantations in the first place? In Mississippi and Louisiana, state penitentiaries are converted plantations. What is a reformed plantation and what is its purpose? Um, if you can't tell the difference between a prison and a plantation? Not sure what to tell you. They are not the same thing. Um, and I'll ask, as I've asked several times, as many other people have asked the same question, what do we do with the next Dylan Roof? What do we do with the next Ted Bundy? What do we do with the next Bernie Madoff? In fact, in the absence of police, how do we find the next Ted Bundy? Riddle, riddle me that. Riddle me that. In the absence of police, in the absence of law enforcement, how do you detect? How do you connect the dots? How do you find and how do you arrest the next Ted Bundy? And then once you have, granted that you have, what do you do with Ted Bundy? I, I would love beyond words to be able to ask one or more of the academics and professionals advocating for the abolition of police and or prisons, those questions, and, and find out what their answers would be. Because I, I rarely, if ever, see anyone pose those questions to anyone on this position or answer them. I've seen several presentations. I've watched several talks and speeches and read several essays. And apparently this is the last paragraph. We must remember that many of these so-called reforms are not new. For as long as the plantation and chattel slavery systems existed, 
There also existed black slave owners, black overseers, and black slave catchers who participated in and profited from the daily operations of white supremacy. So if there is a prison warden who is black or a black police chief or a black police officer, you are equating them with slave owners, racial overseers, and slave catchers. Just so I understand. Got it. Thank you. This is Kyle. They'll send a social worker scribe. Yes, a social worker to, worker to find the next Ted Bundy. I'm sure that'll work out. Thank you, Kyle. The presence of these few black people in elevated positions of power did nothing to change the material conditions of the millions of enslaved people back then. They weren't there to change the conditions. They Okay. And it makes no greater amount of sense to believe they indicate a shift in material conditions for black people now. Are black officers not allowed to arrest white people? Are white officers only charged with arresting black people? And that's it. That's the end of the article. So uh, as before, each time thus far, and likely all of them, I'm guessing, uh, we have a problem presented, whether it's reasonable, true, or rational or not, uh, but no solution offered, no alternative. Uh, most of this was just to say that if you see a black person in a position of power in law enforcement or, I guess, local politics, uh, they are to be considered a token, a window dressing, uh, simply an offering to placate the masses, to have their, I assume, secret white overlords say, ha ha, see, we're not racist. Especially if they're people that are voted into those positions, you know, some police chiefs, mayors, certainly, so on, politicians. But okay, like I've said on many occasion, I will, for the sake of argument, believe in your version of the world for the sake of this article or this presentation, all right? In your world, this is how it works, and this is all true. For the, I will stipulate to it for the novelty's sake. What is the answer? What is your alternative? What is your offer of a solution to the problem you have presented? If you do not know, what the answer is, just say, I don't know. I don't have an answer. I'll, I'll accept that. You know, there's no shame in saying, I don't know. No one is uh, omniscient. No one has all the answers. But given the fact that you've written an essay about the problem, I would have to assume then that you have an alternative to it. You have a solution to the problem. And if the solution just is, abolish police, abolish prisons, uh, then I have to ask, what do you do with the next Dylan Roof? How do you find and what do you do with the next Ted Bundy? What do you do with the next Bernie Madoff? And on and on and on. And so far, no answers. And I'm legitimately curious to know what the answers to those questions are, but uh, what is this now? The the sixth essay from the sixth different person uh, purportedly in a position of authority or expertise on the subject or put a lot of thought into it. And here we are. No further along in the argument. Just that everything's terrible. Get rid of it all. And then big question mark. I'll take a couple of minutes if you guys have any comments or uh, observations of your own, and then I will wrap this up. Uh, scrolling up a bit, Green Death, clearly Scribe Light, if you find one of those individuals, you give them a stem, stern talking to, and then tell them not to do it again and send them along their way. Well, that that is, I mean, to put it ridiculously simply, but more or less, the core of restorative justice thinking. Uh, and I've got a restorative justice TEDx that I might do tomorrow as a follow-up to this. Uh, Jeanette E. Hellis, these people want nothing more than for black people to never succeed. Terrible people think terrible about their own. 
I, I mean, whether, whether it's the, their own or anything else, it's just like, okay, so you are in this indictment of anyone who happens to be black, who's involved in law enforcement or local politics, none of them matter. They, they, they do not matter. They are functionaries. They are just tokens. They are window dressing. They're just there to make people think that things aren't racist. Their individual merits, their individual efforts, their struggles, uh, their professional behavior, uh, anything else about them is irrelevant. We're going to whittle them down to nothing more than their skin color and then dismiss them because of their association professionally. Right? The whole demographic of individuals in law enforcement or lawmaking that are irrelevant, voided, dismissed, simply because of their skin color, or to ignore them, or to look down on them, I guess, according to our author. So I'd be curious to know what would happen if somebody offered our author a position of power in government. Should we dismiss her? Should we veto her relevance? Should we just ignore her if she were to be in a position of such power? I wonder what she would say to that, if that were the case. Uh, thank you, formerly Rod Lyon. They are doing the same thing in K through 12 with education. There are abolitionist teachers that want to tear the school system down. Oh, I'm, <laughs> I am well aware. I am well aware. Uh, one more self-promotion. Uh, I have a playlist, if you do not know, on my channel called Curriculum of Fear, where I've taken a look at many, many, many educators uh, telling us about their intentions or their beliefs about education today. And from the first video in that series to the most recent, uh, since uh, the first video is now what, like uh, four years old, thereabouts, uh, it's scary how many things that used to be on the fringe are now commonplace in promotional videos from professional institutions. Like uh, the first video I did in that series was just somebody put up a, a little web camera at the back of a classroom filming uh, teachers talking amongst themselves. And the most recent videos in that series, in that uh, playlist, are professionally constructed promotional videos from like the National Association of Independent Schools or colleges and things like that. It is interesting and scary how things proceed and how quickly they evolve into basic policy from being something they talked about in classrooms behind closed doors for the most part. Uh, let's see, uh, going back to the chat real quick. Nobody, not me. This is an empty rant. I know. Sorry. I apologize. Uh, James Andrew Morrison, vigilantism is great in a comic. In reality, it leads to might makes right. Yeah. Uh, like I say, look at what happened in Seattle this summer. Look what happened with the chop security force. What were those guys? Those were guys walking around a six block area that had absolutely no law and order, taking the law into their own hands, except it wasn't the law. They were just taking their own personal biases and cra uh, craziness in their own hands with guns and body armor. And people ended up getting killed. Teenagers getting killed for no reason. Uh, people being robbed, people being assaulted, be people being threatened uh, because these guys purported to be some kind of police authority in a lawless territory. That's what you're going to get. Uh, let's see. Renovatio. They are now decolonizing our curriculum here in Ireland. You would think after 800 years of British imperial rule, they would be getting rid of Shakespeare. Nope, they are getting rid of Irish writers because they are white. Uh, yeah. Um, I did a, my very first uh, episode of Familiar with the Matter was with a uh, tailed feature regarding um, education in Scotland. And even though his uh, uh, involvement in education in Scotland was relatively brief, all things considered, a lot of the things he had to say and a lot of things he knew about what was going on there was just mind boggling, scary, really scary. Uh, and so, and I've heard what's been going on in Ireland as well. And it's everything in the in the United Kingdom right now is just bonkers, absolutely bonkers. I don't know how you guys stand it. 
if, if you want to immigrate over here, I would not blame you. But if you've seen some of the things that are on the Biden-Harris agenda for uh, freedom of speech, education, and elsewise, I don't know, man. It's a very, very weird world we live in. And Woodcutta, if police keep standing down, there will be a point of pushback that isn't going to be pretty. Yeah, I mean, between uh, people losing their jobs and livelihoods over the pandemic or the, the restrictions being put on businesses to operate in the pandemic, you add on to that the fear uh, day in, day out that some next quote unquote protest is going to destroy their business entirely. Uh, and if the police just don't take any action or if they're told to stay back, I don't know. They're, they're, and we've seen it already happen in several places, but more and more, the stage is being set for something very, very bad to happen, more so than it already exists. I don't know what that is. I don't know what it's going to look like. But like you say, something's going to give uh, if if there's not a, uh, a sane balance struck soon. Uh, fear over looking bad on camera by local politicians and police officials. Uh, fear of being called racist. We, we saw the extreme example uh, in Britain, uh, in Rotherham. If, if, if you don't believe me, look up. Look up the Rotherham uh, grooming gang scandal, uh, wherein under fear of being called racist, the local authorities declined to investigate or do anything about reported grooming slash rape gangs in their city and let them run amok for years uh, because of cowardice, because of fear of being called bad names. Now, I don't know if we've gotten to that extreme yet, but it sure feels like it sometimes. <sighs> but with that, guys, we are going to call it there. Thank you all for uh, coming and listening. I uh, hope you learned something. I'm not sure if I did, except the continuing narrative of we have problems, but no solutions, except destroy everything and hope God sorts it out, I guess is the, the line. Um, but yeah, if you'd like to see or listen to any more of these, I have a playlist called Essays on Abolition on my channel. Also, if you're curious about what I've covered in the course of education, check out Curriculum of Fear on the playlist. Um, and uh, yeah. I hope everyone is having a good Sunday. I hope you've all had a good weekend elsewise. Um, if you'd like to hear more from me or Satsu Two Cents or The Ranting Monkey, you can find all three of us tomorrow on Monday night on Satsu Two Cents' channel at 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 p.m. Eastern for The Lords of the Night, where we will talk about the news of the day, news stories that you submit, what we've been up to on the internet, and then your questions and comments. Everyone, Thank you for joining me. Thank you for your participation. Those of you that donated, thank you. Thank you so much for your generosity. I really do appreciate it. I hope you are all safe and well. If you're not well, please get well soon, and I'll see you on the next one. Take care. Bye-bye.